it is my treat as a big mystery reader to introduce our author tonight who was going to be in Tallahassee for one of his two Florida stops for his fabulous book tour for Hard Cash Valley. Brian Panowich from Georgia is here tonight. We're thrilled to have you, Brian, um, and grateful to you for making this event possible even in the midst of COVID-19. So thank you so much <laughs> for Thanks. that. A little background for you guys on Brian. He is an award-winning author, a Georgia firefighter, which comes into play in the story, uh, a father to four children. How old are your children, Brian? Uh, they range from 15 to 10, um, all girls except for the youngest, who is a male hand grenade. So, yeah. So how's, how's that homeschooling been going? Um, I can tell you this. Uh, I think that every public school teacher should make at least a million dollars a year. <laughs> we agree. Absolutely. <laughs> that, that, that's something that I, I will lobby for for the rest of my life after the past two months of having to do it. Yeah. So uh, we, we are in sync. We are in sync with you. Um, Brian's first novel, Bull Mountain, was an LA Times Book Prize finalist, which is really prestigious. Uh, an ITW Thriller Award winner for best first novel. A Southern Book Prize winner. That's the Pat Conroy Award. Yes, Did I get that right? Yes, ma'am. That's very impressive. Uh, we actually had Pat Conroy's wife in our store a couple months ago uh, with her wow. memoir, which I'm sure you're familiar with. It was a lot of fun. And um, his book was a finalist for the Anthony and the Berry Award. So all of our mystery fans know what that means. Uh, and his second book was Like Lions. Is that like correct? Lions. So you had Bull Mountain, Like Lions. But we're going to talk about Hard Cash Valley tonight, which I have just finished. I'm so excited about this book. So quick summary, and he's going to tell us more about this, but this book follows Dane Kirby, a lifelong resident and ex-arson investigator for McFalls County, a fictional county in Georgia, where your other two books were also set. So I want to talk about that uh, in just a minute. He gets called in to consult on what might be an arson investigation and of course turns into a brutal murder in Jacksonville. So there's a Florida link to this book. Um, and pairs up, partners up with an FBI uh, agent, Rosalita Velasquez, uh, who is also a fabulous character, Dane, and, uh, and don't call her Rosie. We're, <laughs> we're thrilled right. to be able to talk about Dane and Rosie tonight and their investigation that leads them back to McFalls County. So I, I want to start, um, Brian, by having you tell us a little bit about McFalls County, which is almost its own character. I think in this book, it's in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. It's clear to me that this fictional county has some special significance to you. Tell us about it and tell us why that is. Um, well, first of all, North Georgia is, is pretty much my favorite place on earth. And I've done a lot of traveling. I've been a, a, around the world. I was a military brat growing up, so I've lived in some pretty peculiar places. Um, and as far as the United States is concerned, I've pretty much stepped in almost every state. Um, but something about North Georgia just has, has always affected me, and I love it. In fact, my first book, when I first sat down to write Bull Mountain, I had originally um, thought of doing it in Rabin County, which is right there on the line with, with Tennessee, right there in the foothills, and it's probably one of my favorite places on earth. But I didn't, about halfway through the book, I was like, well, I don't want anybody like coming to me with like a topical map saying, Hey, you know, you said that the sheriff's department was on this street and it's not, it's over here. And then and, and that kind of thing, not to mention, I wanted to be able to have my own history to make up my own history and to expand in this world. And that was the whole point of, of, uh, of, of doing these books as standalones that the, you said it yourself, the, the main character, the only character you can count on seeing from book to book is the actual place of McFalls County, which is, this fictional spot in North Georgia. Um, but I can tell you up front that it is a, a composite of Raven County, Clayton, Georgia, where Clayton Burroughs gets his name from, um, and Fanning County, which I elaborated in, in this book here. If I could just stuff McFalls County right in the middle of all those counties, then that's where it would be. So That's where it would be. And that's, did, did you grow up there or no, you lived? No, yeah. not at all. Um, I, you my, were, you said an army brat, so you lived everywhere. Right. Um, yeah. From, from, I was born in Fort Dix, New Jersey of all places. Oh, wow. um, but yeah, at, at, at eight months old, I had had enough of New Jersey. Um, so we moved, um, at least my father did. And we went 
uh, I've lived, I've lived in Saudi Arabia. I've lived in Germany. Um, we lived in Austria. I lived in Switzerland for a little while. Um, back home to North Carolina, back to Germany, um, from Germany, finally to Georgia. And I was 12 years old when I finally settled here. My father, um, he retired from Fort Gordon in Augusta. Um, so I never really had home type home type home. Like I didn't, I, I always had to say goodbye to everybody after a year, you know, or a year and a half or whatever. And so home for me didn't start till I was 12 years old, but you know, that's when I learned how to drink beer and, and girls and all that. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it kind of, you know, it, that's where life started for me, but North Georgia wasn't even a thing that I knew about either. I couldn't wait to leave Georgia, honestly. Um, after I graduated from Georgia Southern, I wanted to get out of here because I didn't even under know there was like a like a foothills area. I didn't a mountainous area in Georgia. Uh, Augusta and Statesboro went went to school. It was a very flat, kind of unremarkable area in a in the sense to where not a whole lot to offer what I wanted to do for a living. Um, so I couldn't wait to leave. And I, in fact, I moved to Florida. Moved to moved to Florida. I was in Pensacola, and that's where my band when I was playing music, and we had a big hit in uh and south florida so we moved to pensacola so that we could still play everywhere and so florida's very dear to me um and pensacola and mobile that that area right there mobile Bay. anyway um i met my wife and my wife was from north georgia and um so when i got back home after my, after my first daughter was born i was like oh my god where did this come from and so i met her like whole family and i found out where that place was and and i just instantly was fascinated with my home state so it's 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 a it's a wonderful character in your book uh there's such a sense of place there so i want to talk a little bit about your characters and i, I mentioned this to brian um before we actually opened it up to everyone that I, his character development is really remarkable he writes in a way where you instantly in your mind's eye have a sense of the characters he's telling you about um, and it's not overdone. It doesn't take hundreds of pages to, to imagine these people. But one thing I really love about your characters is they are so human. They are not superheroes. They are, right. e even the ones that should be the superheroes, your protagonists in the book, uh, guys and gals are flawed in some way, which, which gives the book sort of, I think, it, it makes it very real. And I think there are definitely some mysteries where that is not the case. So can you talk a little bit about character development and about your protagonist, Dane Kirby, and then um, some of the other major characters in the book? Sure. Um, well, first of all, if, if you do ever read my entire body of work, or if you get started on another book, don't get used to any of these characters because you might not see them again. Like I said, the only character you can count on seeing again is the actual county itself because world building is, is so much more fun to me than getting one guy into trouble and getting him out of trouble and getting, um, but the thing is like you rarely, if ever, has anybody ever met a Jack Reacher? I mean, it makes for great, great, you know, reading. It makes for great movies. But, I mean, come on, man. I mean, a sheriff in North Georgia is not going to find a dead body every every 20, you know, every year. So, you know, something, it's not going to fall into his lap. There are writers out there that do a fantastic job at that. But um, for me, it's much more interesting to have people that have real life issues that they have to carry around and figure out because I'm so much more relatable to those characters. And, you know, Elmore Leonard was a genius at it and he is my mentor in life. So, I mean, when it comes to like what I grew up reading, that's how I always imagined it. You know, these characters are not, you know, they're, they're not combat trained superheroes, right? They're just normal people that have fallen into unusual circumstances and they have to figure out a way out. And just like you or I would, if it would happen to me or you. So, so set the scene for us a little bit with your characters, elaborate a little bit on the plot line. I don't want to give away what sure. I know, <laughs> sure. but give okay. everybody a taste of sort of the story. Well, Dane, uh, the whole book started with the concept of Dane Kirby as a character who had lost everything. At some point in his life, he had lost his entire family and he just, I, it always intrigued me like why, um, when tragedy like that exists for somebody, why it's so important um, for them to have to let go of that. 
there's always a point in time where like the rest of the people in your life say, Hey, it's time to move on. You know, well, why, why, why should he? So I, this concept of a character who decided that he wasn't going to let go and that he still came home and he talked to his wife and he talked to his daughter and, and, and these things, you know, so that, that's what, that's what created Dan Kirby was this character. So I actually had no idea where I was going to take him. But um, there were a couple of things I wanted to touch on as the story started. Um, if, if he starts off broken like this, how would he handle all of this other stuff that happens to him, like, like that's thrown at him throughout the story? Um, and so I kept that in the back of my head. Like, he's, he's truly haunted, but at the same time, he's not ready to give up on life. Um, and so when he gets called in to uh, investigate this murder, um, he really has no idea why he's there. He, he's trying to like shoot darts and just ride a desk, you know, because he's, he's done with, with his career and he's done with trying to follow that life. Um, but he, he gets asked to call to do this thing and gets involved with the FBI and it gives him something to do. That's essentially how it starts. Wow. Okay. This is something to get my mind off of everything that I always think about constantly. And, um, as the story progresses, he has to face his own demons and, without giving too much of it away, he, he's able to do that by the people that he comes into contact with, whether they be good or bad. And in my books, most of that is really the same. I love that gray area in between. Um, I, I matched him up with somebody who would probably be the least uh, possible uh, character that, that, that a guy like Dane Kirby would, would, would be met, paired up with. Um, and uh, and I fell in love with her. She was not actually Ro Rosalita Velasquez. Was not even supposed to be as big a part of the story as she was. But once I got about halfway through it, she was telling me what to do. You know, <laughs> I believe that. <laughs> and so so when you when you get right. to that point where your characters are saying, "Hey, no, stop! You you need to," I would never do that. This is how, what I would do. Then I I, I knew I was on to something. You know, so that's essentially it. It's like Dan, it's Dane's progression. From, from a guy who has honestly nothing left to lose in the world to finding out that there's so much more to lose if you open your eyes to it. So, yeah. You know, it's it's, I, mean, I, I thought I also I should ask you about William to talk a little <laughs> bit about William is. He's, he's uh, such a well-written, um, interesting, intriguing, sympathetic, sort of character who is in some ways very central to the story. So tell us who well, William, William is. Well, William is the hero. <laughs> William's the hero, man, in every sense of the, of the word. And that was the most scary part of writing this book, was William is on the spectrum. Um, and Asperger's is not something that is talked about or, 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 or known uh, specifically in, in rural areas like, like in North Georgia. Um, let's just say like, like five years ago, even, you know, if a, if a kid had Asperger's syndrome or, or was on the spectrum in that way, he would just be written off, you know, as, as just, just a freak or a weirdo. And, and his parents wouldn't realize that there are, you know, significant treatments out there or, or routines that can increase their quality of life. So I wanted that to be important. You know, I wanted to shine a light on that a little bit. My nephew has Asperger's, so for me, it was I've seen him go from one side to the other, like where, where nobody knew what to do with him because nobody understood how his brain worked. And then once he was diagnosed, and then once he got the treatment and the routine that he needed, his quality of life just skyrocketed. And the kid is a genius; he's just awesome. He's just a great kid. So, um, so that that played into the book really well too, and um. And I'm really happy to, to have heard from parents and heard from actual kids that are on the spectrum who have, who have gone through some of the things that William has gone through, like at least as far as not being recognized as, you know, being different. They reached out to me and said, man, you, you, you got this. He's like, you did it. And I was like, yes, yeah, I'm so scared that I was going to get torn apart for that. But, but uh, yeah, it worked. It worked. He's, he's wonderful. Tell us a little bit about Gwen also. I, I think the way you used Gwen 
to tell this story is, is not only moving, but really effective. I mean, I thought at first when I started the book, I, I didn't think Gwen was a minor character. She clearly, and this is for, for all of you who may have not read the book yet, um, Dane's um, deceased wife, but she is, she is a central figure throughout the book, at least in his world. Most definitely. Ways. I felt like if Gwen, the character of Gwen, if that didn't work, then the whole book would have fallen apart. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, because I'm not a supernatural writer um, and the concept of writing about uh, a ghost um, never even crossed my mind as I was writing this book. This is simply a man who was in love to the point where he was not able to, uh, to move on with his life unless he was able to keep her in it. So he talks to her on the regular, you know, on the, and she's constantly trying to nudge him toward, you know, c c you need to get on with your life, but he doesn't want to, you know, he doesn't want to, he wants to be with her and he can't. And so that's the, the tug. And this is a love story, man. I gotta be honest with you. I'm going to tell you from the jump, I wrote Bull Mountain and it was a, it was a, it was a crime fiction story. It's the godfather of North Georgia is essentially what that was, <laughs> you know? Um, like Lions was a follow-up that everybody wanted to read about Clayton. I wanted to write about his wife, Kate, who I had fallen in love with in the first book and wanted to write her story. So it's more of a story about her and the fallout. But, and, and, but there's still central crime stories. This, for me, was a love story between Dane and Gwen. Hands down. They opened the book that way. When you meet him, you know who he is. They closed the book that way. And they, yeah, so I, I guess, and it's been pointed out to me on several occasions, like, wow, you're a, you're a softie, man. <laughs> you're, it's you're much a romantic. more than a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I really like mysteries that are stories at, at their heart are really, really good stories, more so than even the puzzle of a mystery or the who done it or how are we gonna find the bad guys, but, but tell a story and this, this is definitely a love story, but not only for, you know, the relationship between, you know, Dave and Gwen or, you know, the, the feelings we have for William, but also Dane and his friends um, yeah, who most are really interesting, Ned and Keith. Um, and I have to tell you, or I guess to ask you, there has to be some of you in each of these characters. Somehow. I noticed your tattoo and I know Keith has this quite yep. a description about Keith's tattoo in the book. So tell us about the relationship between Dane and his buddies. Okay. Um, well, like I said uh, a few minutes ago, I, I never really had friends that I grew up with from day one. I didn't, ha I didn't make friends until I was 12, 13 years old because that's when we finally settled. So when, when I met my wife and we started, um, when I saw that she knew and actually were still friends with people she had gone to grade school with or, or was born in the same hospital as, it, I was fascinated by that concept. I love that. So I'm, I'm still fascinated by that. Um, I think it's amazing how people connect on a level that's so primal that they, they just are in each other's life forever. But, um, but yeah, the, the three characters in this book the three childhood buddies of Dane, Kirby, Ned Lemon, and Keith Bell. Um, I think there's more of me in Dane than any of the characters, um, or actually any character I've ever written, um, mm. which was surprising because normally I start off writing uh, like the best version of myself, and then that character becomes <laughs> whoever it you know it becomes, and then it's not me anymore. That's happened to me so many times. I can't. Yeah, but Dane, Dane continuously had that, that effect on me. And then my, my best friend, Dave, is, is Ned Lemon all day. Uh, and, and Keith is based on an actual Keith Bell. He was a, he's a great friend of mine who was one of my first inspirations to write. Um, and I describe him to a T. And he is, he's, a, he's a real guy, as is Dane Kirby, actually. If you look at the, the sheriff of Fannin County, um, currently sitting in the sheriff's seat, his name is Dan Kirby. I, yeah, he gave me his name to use. So it's wonderful. Yeah, that's well, pretty I'm cool. take... 
<laughs> so we're going to keep talking, but I'm going to take just a minute to tell our audience, if you have questions for Brian, you are muted, but if you could use your question as a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, click on that, send me your questions, and we'll try to get through as many as possible with Brian before we let him go back to his fabulous life in uh, Georgia. So I'm oh, going yeah. to keep going with <laughs> to, to my four kids. this question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're enjoying this break. Is that what you're saying? It's I a love Friday. it. They have to be upstairs and quiet. <laughs> exactly. Um, so tell us uh, about Hard Cash Valley and the farm. Tell us what the farm is. Uh, the farm is a notorious uh, area of McFalls County. Um, it's, it's called the Rockdale Farm, named after the Rockdale family who own it. Um, but it's, it's notorious across country for cockfighting, um, which I won't ever say I condone, but I will say is a large part of, of, uh, of the community up there i mean it's it's a thing it exists um and it's one of those things that a lot of a lot of the police turn a blind eye to um because they nobody thinks it's really a big deal um but it, it kind of is i mean it's it's nefarious it's an in insidious blood sport and and so i uh i wanted to include that in my book because i felt like that was something that had not been touched on before like there's so many rural mysteries out there where there's so many avenues and dark alleys um the farm is a place that exists at the end of an unmarked dirt road does that make sense if you turn down this road you're clearly not supposed to be there because it's not marked and when you get to where you're going you're going to find some bad shit and and that is exactly what the farm is the farm is a place that you have no business going to unless you're invited and even then you're kind of scared to be there and so I wanted to create that real tension and, and that real, but at the same time, I wanted it to be relatable to the people that know of that kind of thing and, and understand that it does exist. And, and yeah, I, and I also wanted to make sure that everybody knew that William could uh, hold his own in a, in a situation like that. So, and he does, and he's a, he's a, he, what, 15 year old kid, 15 year old kid in an in horrible situation like that. And he walks away. And to me, that just said eons about the character. So that, that was, that's where that came from. In fact, the book was actually called Cockfighter before I found out there was a very famous book already called Cockfighter. Um, and so, and so that's where, yeah, that's what that's I That's you had to come up with a new name. So how yeah. did you go from uh, firefighting or, you know, essentially being in the fire business to writing. How, how did that happen? Walk us through that. Oh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's interesting story. I don't, I kind of fell into everything. I'm the accidental novelist. I'm the accidental fireman. Um, I have spent most of my adult life wanting to be Bruce Springsteen. Um, I, <laughs> I, I, I made a deal with my dad, you know, when I went to college, if I get a degree, get off my back for five years and let me play music. And that's what I wanted to do. And he was like, done, that's a deal. And that's how I ended up in Pensacola living in Florida was my band was playing music. And that's how I supported myself for almost 15 years. Um, but I was a very story oriented writer as far as songs were concerned. Um, you know, I, I listened to a lot of Bruce Springsteen and a lot of character driven story songs. And I love that, Dire Straits and that kind of thing. And so uh, it came across in the way I wrote songs. Well, when my first daughter was born, um, I knew I wasn't gonna miss a minute of that. So, uh, so I moved home to Georgia, stopped playing music. And when I got to Georgia, I didn't have a skill set. You know, I had a psychology degree that is pretty much useless unless I wanted to go back to school or be a substitute teacher, um, which now I know should make a million dollars a year. Um, but anyway, I, I had no, no skills that I was very, and so I, I reached out to a friend of mine who I used to play music with before I left Georgia and, um, he was working on the fire department and he said, Hey man, um, why don't you do this? And I was like, well, tell me about it. And he's like, well, you, you go to work for 24 hours and then you're off for 48. So that means when you get off in the morning, it's like, it's a weekend every, every time you get off. And I was like, that is exactly what I need to be doing. Exactly. So I went and got certified and did all, I went to school and I got everything I needed. Um, and I got hired on the fire department, but 
problem was is that I had spent so much time being in the spotlight and having a creative outlet by writing songs and, and making music that when I went to work for the fire department, I didn't have that anymore. So I was, I, I was, it's like a hole in me. There was something missing. So, um, a friend of mine turned me on to flash fiction, um, just as a fluke. And I started reading a lot of flash fiction. And if, if anybody out there listening to me doesn't know what that is, um, you can go online, just type in flash fiction. You're going to see a bunch of websites come up and they are bite sized stories, take you five minutes to read under a thousand words, 700 words. Um, and there's a lot of crime fiction, um, websites out there that have these like shotgun, honey, uh, dot com, uh, flash fiction offensive is another one, all these great websites where I could read all these really cool stories. And so it was almost like just a shift in pitch. Like instead of me writing songs, I started writing these little flash fiction snippet stories and that's was it. It filled the hole. It's like, Oh my God, I love this. This is great. I get to tell these little stories. And as I got an idea, I would tell a story and I'd submit it. And if it got published, great. If it didn't, it didn't, but never for money or never looking to pursue a career in, in, in as being a novelist, just that was enough for me. So I was a fireman who wrote short stories just because I enjoyed doing it. And then a New York literary agent read one of those short stories. And before you knew it, I was, I wrote a book and he sold it to the biggest publisher in the world. And now my life is completely different. That's amazing. Well, so we're getting some questions from some people on the call. Um, Katie is asking about your writing process. She gave us a great lead in to how you became a writer in flash cool. fiction and writing short stories. But what is your writing process look like now, especially in the middle of a pandemic with four children, you know, at home? I, uh, I get it in where I can, essentially. Um, most of my writing takes place at night uh, or early morning. Once, once they're up, there's no, like, it's four kids, man, and they're all young. So it, it's tough for me to do anything outside of, like, trying to keep things from being broken. Um, or, or, or the, or keeping the bickering down, um, which is odd for me because, but when they were in school before this thing happened, that was my routine. I'd take them to school. I would write when they were done at school, I'd pick them up and then I would go back to being dad and I would have my like four or 5,000 words done a day. Now with them here all the time, I love them. Uh, please don't think I don't. I love them. Um, there's a there's a wonderful thing in the bag of Hardcash Valley for my son, by the way, uh, because I wanted him to be included in this love story. Um, but uh, but now it's like now I have to wear them out, and once that's done, then I get a minute to breathe, and then I get to work on what it is I'm doing. And actually, what I've been doing recently is a whole lot of interviews, a whole lot of press, uh, uh, print releases and stuff like that, because I'm stuck here. Normally I would be out there on the road, shaking hands and, and hanging out with people. And I miss that. I miss hugging necks, man. Like you wouldn't believe. Uh, well, we've already yeah, told but, you, you have to come to Midtown Reader, you know, uh, once this is over, we'll have to have Oh, you Sally, I'd be there in a hot second. If I, I, I know, I know, me. we know we're so grateful for this. So I have another question for you. Marjorie Turnbull says, I am an instant fan. I married a seventh generation North Georgian, still have a vacation place on his family land, have owned land in Fannin County, and have wandered over most of North Georgia. I am wondering how you would describe what makes North Georgians different in terms of values and the way they view life. And is that reflected in your characters by the way, my nephew is the assistant fire chief for Tacoa. Did I pronounce that right? Yes, you did. Tacoa is correct. Right. Okay. Wow, that's very cool. Um, that's a great question. What fascinates me the most, and I can only speak for, for Georgia because I haven't spent a lot of time in rural areas in, say, like North Carolina or Virginia, West Virginia, that kind of thing. But what I can say about Georgia, I'll say two things, and I hope that this answers your question. Um, Land is paramount. Um, it's, it's the one thing that you cannot um, take from these people. Um, the, the, the people that I have met, the people in my family on that side um, that live there, 
that land is God given and they will fight tooth and nail before you come in. I'm not even accepted as one of them because I'm not from there. You know, my blood's not in that dirt. It's not what made it red. You know, that red clay is because of them, man. So I'm allowed to be there as long as I represent them correctly. But, um, but yeah, that connection to land and to family are two things that I have never experienced in my life until as an adult, I got to turn back around and look and see and, 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 and experience it. So, so for me, Bannon County in particular, um, I mean, it, this character in this book, Dane Kirby, who I named after the actual sheriff of, of Bannon County, he was born in Blue Ridge. He was raised in Blue Ridge. He went to college in Blue Ridge. Now he is the sitting sheriff in Fannin County. So there, that's, that's what that man knows. And there's no taking that out of him. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost you can't separate the person from the land. Those two things are inseparable. And family is the same way. I mean, and that's why a lot of my characters bend the rules, um, even though they're not supposed to especially in law enforcement, because the rules are meant to be broken if they intersect with the honor of land and family. And, and that's, that's North Georgia to me. Um, I'll also say this, and this is something that my father-in-law said to me once, and I never forget it. And I will always say this every time somebody asks me a question related to those people up there. He said to me, one time I asked him, I was like, how come, because I didn't know that Georgia was so involved in bootlegging. Had no idea. Um, you always see West Virginia's famous for it, man. You know, you always see that kind of thing on, on in the films with like Matt Butterant's movie um, and his book. And um, you're, you're like, well, what happened? Why don't you hear about Georgia? And my father-in-law, as smug as can be, man, just leaned back in his rocker, man, and he took a drag off his pipe. He said, because we're fucking smarter than the rest of them. <laughs> and that, that is what I wanted to get across in my books. These people are nobody's fool. Nobody's fool. There is no way they could have built an empire like they did over the course of the past 70 years without being smarter than the rest of them. And that's North Georgia. You're welcome. I love that. Well, it's actually a great segue to another uh, uh, question from one of our Midtown readers. Derek Wells says, Dane is a great protagonist. Will we see Dane again, perhaps a prequel or short stories or something? And you and I were talking about this before we got started, that your books are not really sequels or prequels or any of that. And you really like to write about new characters, but he is a great protagonist. And without giving away too much, I think it's safe for me to say the book ends in a way that sort of makes us think there are more Dane stories. Is that a possibility or Dane's done? I will say this. Um, Dane is not done, but you won't necessarily see Dane after this book. I will okay. jump back in time. Um, and that was the, like the whole concept of having the, the, the idea of, of having a, the county and the area be the main character was that I would be able to go back and tell stories and have characters cross over before other stories had already happened and that kind of thing. Um, this book in particular, the end of this book, um, there's no way for me to say to anyone out there listening that you're gonna see Dane again until you read this book and know how it ends. Um, I don't wanna ruin that for anyone. No, um, not gonna do it, I'm the, not doing that. <laughs> at the same time, I won't say that this is like all you get from Dane because I like the character enough and enough people have, have come to me and said, this is, this is somebody I'd like to read about again. So that concept has crossed my mind. But like I said, don't get connected. Don't, don't get too attached. Don't well, it's interesting attached. because we had a terrific mystery author, uh, suspense writer at Midtown Reader a couple of years ago, Christine Carbo. I don't know if you've met her, or familiar with her, but she is from uh, Whitefish, Montana, and she writes a series of stories set in Glacier National Park. And in her books, Glacier is the main character. And the law enforcement officials and detectives and FBI agents um, sort of flow from one book to the next. But she, she, people may make an appearance again, but you can't get attached to them right. because they're gone. And she said something very similar in terms of the way you're describing um, region and place as a character. And I, I think that's really fascinating. Well, 
I'm clearly not the first one to do it. Um, you know, it's been, uh, Faulkner did it, you know? I mean, mm-hmm. he, 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 with his county, with his fictional county, I mean, Elmore Leonard did it with, with, um, with Detroit. Even though it was a real place, it was still Leonard's Detroit, you know? It was his, like, characters. And one character could be a main character in, in a story, um, and you could love that book. But if you're a fan of the full body of work, you'll know that somebody he just talked to on the phone is a main character in another book. Uh, you know, and that might that whole story might have happened two years later, but you don't know because you have to, you know, you, you just dig in. So I always I love that connected tissue. And I like to throw this out there, too. Stan Lee um, is a huge influence on me. I've been a comic book nerd since I was a kid. My dad wrote read comics to me and taught me how to read. So Stan Lee was a genius at that. It was New York. But still, you could read about one of his characters. And I'll say it because I don't care. I'm not literary. I'm, you can read about Spider-Man, but there would be some character fly by in the background, and that character's story would be playing out in a different in a different comic altogether. So, and I love that connective tissue of everybody being involved in each other's stories. So, will we see Dane again? Yes, but will we see Dane from this book? Yeah. Probably not. It, well, it's, so you're selling yourself short, and I have to tell all of our listeners and all the participants, you keep downplaying and having so much humility about your writing, but you're a terrific writer, and I think one of the things that makes it so interesting is that it's not formulaic. I mean, having new characters or not having sort of the same detective or the same law enforcement official or the same protagonist um, it gives you the flexibility to sort of go in a lot of different directions, but still be grounded in in the character of place. And you're a master at that. Uh, it's really remarkable. So I want everybody to know you're showing a lot of humility, but it is um, it, it's a terrific, terrific read. And I told you before we started, I have to go back and read your first two books. Tell us what you're reading during the pandemic. We know great writers read. What are you reading right now that's good? Um, what would you recommend? Well, I tell you what, I, I just, I finished reading um, a book for, for a, a fellow Minotaur um, novelist called Every, uh, Every Last Fear, which I'm, I'm in the process of, uh, of writing a review on, but that won't be out until 2021. So we'll, we'll talk about that when I come back for the, for the paperback. But Um, what I did instead of like reaching out for new books, because I'm actually working on this fourth novel now, um, I didn't want any outside influence, um, on what I'm writing right now. And it's weird for me because as a mystery writer, if I'm reading a lot of mysteries, then it seeps into the cracks while I'm writing. And so I don't like to do that. So I try to either revisit things that I've already know of, or I'll reach out to something completely off the wall. Um, this is one, uh, Shadow of the Lions. He's another Georgia writer uh, by Christopher Swan. Um, just a brilliant book, brilliant from the beginning to end. One of the smartest, um, most intelligent mysteries I've ever read that really uh, made me come face to face with like atrocity of the world without it making it like overwhelming like he didn't he didn't have to tell me how bad it was because i already knew this was a brilliant book so i reread this one and um and he's as good as they come and also this is uh, another one that i've i've read maybe four times now that i read again and me and my daughter actually read this together um she's 15 it's called the never open desert diner by james anderson who I herald as probably the greatest American living writer that we have today. And the idea that, that James is not a household name um, is remarkable to me because it, it, the, the song remains the same, Sally. Everybody's rewriting stories that have already happened. It's, it's hard to come up with something completely brand new. This you have never read before, I swear. And, and it, it, will, it will blow your mind. If you don't have this, Sally will get it for you. And then you can come and schedule an appointment, which I think is incredible. I wish appointment, bookstore appointments were like a thing forever. It might um, have to be. We may have to continue those. That's the cool the thing of all time. But <laughs> Sally will get you this book and send it to you. And, and you will be astonished. And when you're done, um, feel free to reach out and thank me and her both. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate yeah. the pitch very, very much. 
Well, I should say that you have been kind enough to send us um, some book plates, signed book plates for this book. And we do have plenty of copies of Hard Cash Valley available in store. And you were also nice enough, Ron, to tell me that you have a special giveaway. So we have decided yeah. if you've already brought, bought Hard Cash Valley for Midtown Reader, or you're going to buy it, you know, in the next, let's just say in the next 10 days, we will enter you into a drawing for this amazing thing that Brian is going to tell you he is donating to our store. I'm just thrilled. Okay. Tell us about it. Okay, cool. All right. So, first of all, let me see if I can move this camera a little bit. Does that, can everybody see that painting hanging, hanging right above those books okay yes. that painting was done by a fellow named todd campbell who took place in a in a in a thing that my local bookstore the book tavern um in augusta georgia they uh they put together a an art show where 12 artists um did their interpretation local artists did their interpretation of my first novel um and so i ended up buying that one because it made me cry <laughs> but uh but while we were there, the things that were for sale at that art show, um, one of the things was we have a signed um, lithograph. If you can see that, that's uh, the Bull Mountain Art Show that took place um, when Bull Mountain came out. And the artist who did this artwork, which is fantastic, man, is his, Kenny is insanely good. He signed and they're all numbered. There were only 50 of these. And there is only four left, and I have those four. So I have, this one is number six, number six in the series of one through 50. So if, um, if Sally, if you want to figure out how to get this to whoever, um, I will um, make sure this goes out professionally and gets mailed to them. That's incredibly yeah. generous of you. Thank yeah. you for your obvious love of and support of independent bookstores, uh, Brian, which is so important. I wouldn't and have a career if it wasn't for you, Sally. Well, my, first, is, my first novel was hand sold by, by independent bookstores. And if that didn't happen, I wouldn't be here talking to you. So well, I love we, you more than you We're know. incredibly grateful. We will love hand selling your books. We can't wait till you actually can make it into the store. One last question bef before we let you go. Um, which is what advice would you have? We have some people on the call who are aspiring writers. What advice would you give them? It can be lonely. It can be a long process. What advice would you give uh, the folks on the call who are trying to write? I love this question. Um, first of all, strike aspiring from that sentence because you either write or you don't. If you're writing, then you're a writer. So aspiring is, is an unnecessary adjective Duly noted to add to my vocabulary. Get it, get, uh, I mean, if, if you feel like you're an aspiring writer, um, that means someone who has yet to sit down and write a thing. So get rid of that and be a writer. That's part one. Part two is learn all the rules. Um, learn, learn the rules of grammar. Learn everything you can from the people you admire the most. Um, read as much as you can from the people that you admire most, um, that, that you aspire to be like. Um, and then throw all that shit away. Throw it all <laughs> away. Throw it all away and sit down and tell me your best story. Tell me your best story. So learn the rules, forget the rules, sit down and finish it. And then make sure people see it. Put yourself out there. Because if you don't put yourself out there, then there's no point in doing any of it. If that, unless that's what you want. If you write for yourself, great. Then that's awesome. I think that's an amazing cathartic thing. But if you want other people to read you, then tenacity, baby. Tenacity throws the party. You know, mm. luck, luck is simply an uh, invited spectator. What an amazing conversation. What a great way to end. We could go on for hours. I really could monopolize you and all these Midtown readers I hope for the so rest of the point. pandemic. <laughs> I'm so much more charming in person, I swear. <laughs> well, that's why we're going to have you back. Hard Cash Valley, we have this in store. You can pick it up curbside or we will deliver it for free. And as we mentioned, we do have private browsing and beginning June 1, you can come back in the store. So we're really excited about hand selling your book. I'm going back and getting Bull Mountain and starting it this weekend after having finished this. Thank you so much, Brian, truly. Sally, I can't um, tell you how much it means to me, even though it's, it's virtual, to finally be in Florida, 
to Yay. finally be in a Florida bookstore. <laughs> it makes me so happy. And you guys have been awesome. So thank well, you. Well, so we're much. thrilled to be your first Florida stop. And we look forward to welcoming you to Tallahassee soon. So stay I'll come safe, every everybody. Time you want me. We'll see everybody soon. Have a great weekend. Bye. Bye.